All right. Thanks for confirming. So yeah, we are starting a little late. Sorry, for, sorry about that. Uh, we'll try to still go through everything, and then I can answer questions. So yeah, thanks for joining in in this session on under the hood uh, implementation side of uh, trying to replace Zookeeper from Druid. So the context is like Druid used to depend very heavily on the Zookeeper. And over the years, we have been trying to reduce the, the different use cases where we use the Zookeeper and shrink it to a place where we can actually uh, replace it and have the option to use something else other than Zookeeper for all the coordination, et cetera, needs. So the, in this session, I my hope is to demystify the design and the implementation a little bit so that uh, users have a good idea of how things work and also the Druid community members can also learn a little bit about how it is implemented to a certain degree. So the agenda for this talk is to, of course, talk about uh, talk a little about Druid's architecture and how it uses Zookeeper to do different things. And then we talk about a uh, little bit about the design things that we use to uh, do things like state synchronization without having Zookeeper, and then what we are actually using Kubernetes for when we say we use Kubernetes instead of Zookeeper in this context. So uh, yeah, I don't know. Maybe the audience is very familiar with Druid and Kubernetes, but I assumed you kind of have a passing familiarity with it. So I tried to go through some of the high level concepts in this talk uh, just to keep the discussion relevant. So uh, Druid is a major uh, distributed database it is used a lot for real time analytics in, in different use cases I, i've been used it over the years in wherever i worked mostly at yahoo at splunk for a number of use cases uh, in terms of features you can get data inside druid in a number of different ways there are some features called real time ingestion where you can you have your kafka where you are streaming your events and you can connect your kafka uh, directly to the Druid, and Druid will start pulling all the data out of Kafka. Uh, there is another notion of batch ingestion where you might have your data sitting somewhere on the SDFS or S3, and then you can tell Druid to just go read off all that data in a batch job and ingest it inside Druid. So uh, that's how you get data inside Druid. Once it is stored inside Druid, you can either send SQL queries to it. So it supports a subset of overall SQL, uh, or you can just send HTTP request with a Druid specific query format, which is described using JSON. And also some of the features it has, so it doesn't have like the fact to fact sort of joins where you have two large tables stored in Druid and you want to join across those, but it does offer dimension joins where you have like one large table containing facts and another small table containing dimensions, and you can sort of do the hash joins on that data. It is very pluggable and extensible in terms of what you can do with it. So one of the things very extensible is the aggregation support. So people have been able to implement uh, their custom columns. And one of the custom column, which is actually very popular, is the data sketches that is used for doing approximate distinct count and histograms, et cetera. So in terms of the overall architecture, so on the top side, basically, there are six type of Druid nodes in a Druid cluster. Uh, there are the master servers, which kind of look after coordinating various work inside the cluster. There are query servers, which process, uh, which coordinate the query processing and does some part of the query processing by themselves. And there are data servers, which are responsible for like processing all the data, be it uh, consuming and storing it inside Druid or serving it for querying, et cetera. And those are the middle managers and historicals. And then Druid cluster itself has few external dependencies. So it needs access to uh, metadata storage, which could be a Postgres, a MySQL, or it is actually a pluggable 
components so you, you can have your own implementation and support arbitrary relational databases that can be used at the metadata store where druid will store a lot of its critical uh, runtime information then uh, historically it has used zookeeper for a lot of the coordination and we'll dive a lot more deeper into how and where zookeeper gets utilized and then it needs access to a something called deep storage component and so deep storage would be something like s3 or hdfs basically a place where you can reliably store large amount of data just as files uh, so let's try to understand how data gets inside the Druid system. So as a user, your data might be sitting in Kafka, Genesis, S3, or anywhere. So there are like a lot of different uh, number of sources which are supported in Druid. As a user, you, you will submit something called a task to this node called Overlord. So for example, if you wanted to pull data from Kafka continuously, you submit uh, actually, in for pulling from Kafka, you submit something called a supervisor. In that spec, you list uh, what is your Kafka broker address, what is your topic, and et cetera, and which table in the Druid you want to ingest the data. And then Overlord, in turn, will start a bunch of tasks, depending upon how many partitions you, ha you have in your Kafka topic. And then it will assign those tasks to these worker nodes called middle managers and they will run those tasks and as part of running those tasks they will consume data from kafka and then as they are consuming data from kafka they will create uh, indexed files it's called a druid segment so druid uses its own columnar format for uh, storing and persisting the data you can think of it it is very similar to parquet or orc for that matter, and once it has built those segments, and for like Kafka and Kinesis, the streaming ingestion, it is continuously building those segments, and it keeps on storing them onto its deep storage, which could be S3 or whatever, right? So after, uh, so that's the number five. After middle manager is, as middle manager is storing these segments on the deep storage, it also makes a call back. This that's the number arrow six makes HTTP call to overlord telling it, hey, like I created these segments, uh, create the metadata to track these segments. So at that point, overlord will go and put an entry inside the DB. That's the metadata store. Like these are all the segments that got created for the specific set of tables. So that's how data gets into the system. Uh, the part about Zookeeper is it is getting used for all the task management coordination. So for example, when Overlord wants to assign a task to a specific middle manager, it will create a Z node in the zookeeper on a specific path uh, for that middle manager. And all the middle managers are watching uh, Z nodes for their specific host names in the zookeeper. So as soon as Overlord creates an entry in zookeeper, the middle managers will get notification about it. And that's how they know a task got assigned to me and I'm supposed to run it. And in turn, so as they are running the task, they also need to propagate the task runtime information, like whether the task is in progress, failed, successful, or how much work it has already done. So all the task runtime information, those middle managers will store back into Zookeeper in a separate Z node. And Overlord in turn will be watching those Z nodes to keep track of what is the status of each individual task? So Overlord actually offers the APIs where you can say things like, okay, tell me what's happening with this task, whether it's in progress or for example, from Kafka until what offset it has consumed the data and things like that. So all that state coordination is managed by the zookeeper. So now you have the data inside Druid. Next thing is, being able to query it. So before data can be queried in Druid, it, it needs to be sitting on one of the data nodes inside Druid cluster. So for example, when as we are doing the ingestion, data is sitting on the middle manager. And middle managers are also actually making this data available for querying as they are building the segments. But once they have fully built the Druid segment and moved into the deep storage, 
and the entry for that has been created inside the database. From that point onwards, uh, those segments are kind of immutable, persisted in the Druid system. And there is another set of nodes called historical nodes, which are supposed to serve those fully baked immutable segments. So those segments somehow need to land from the S3 to the historical nodes. And the way that works is so there's another master node called coordinator uh, that is constantly pulling the database for about for each individual table, what are the segments that exists. And once it notices that a new set of segments have been created, then it will see which historical is serving how many segments and then assign the segments appropriately to the historical nodes. And once it has figured out which segment needs to be loaded on which historical, it again uses Zookeeper to propagate this information. So for example, if there's a segment that it assigned to historical one, then it will go to Zookeeper and there'll be a Z note path specific to the historical one. It will make an entry there like, hey, the segment has, has been assigned to you. Uh, load it, please. So that, uh, so, and that would, be the arrow number three where historical, of course, is watching uh, the Z node and it will get notified immediately that I'm supposed to be loading this segment and uh, that uh, the Z node will contain all the metadata about like where this segment is location, what its name, what the data it contains, etc. So it will it will go to the deep storage, download those segment on its local disk and then Arrow number five is where basically it announces that I'm starting uh, serving certain segments. So that coordinator knows like which historicals are serving which segments. So now the segments are loaded on the historicals and they can be queried. So yeah, so this is again the announcement part. So Coordinator, of course, needs to know which historical is serving which segment. Also, there is a node called broker, which is responsible for coordinating the query processing. Your queries typically land on this broker node. So it knows which data node, be it the middle manager or the historical. Historicals are serving the immutable segments, which are fully built, and middle managers are serving uh, kind of the virtual segments which are still in process to be completed, not fully completed bef before they actually land on the S3. But, but again, the coordination mechanism is the same. The data nodes are pu pushing some information inside the Z nodes and broker or coordinator who needs to know which, which node is serving what data. They watch the specific paths on the Zookeeper. So as soon as any node starts serving something or drops something, they update the zookeeper and the other party receive the note, receives the notification. So broker will have a local cache of which node is serving what data and they will be able to keep that local cache up to date based on the notifications received. Okay. Okay, so quickly, so this, uh, we are running short on time, so I try to walk through. So this is the query processing flow. Basically, as a user, you submit your query to broker. It knows which data node is serving what data, so it will kind of uh, scatter the query on those data nodes, and those data nodes individually will process the query fragments for the data they have locally sitting on their disk and all the data nodes will respond back to the broker. Broker will further merge the data and respond to the user. So the Druid's query engine is a one level scatter gather. And yeah, let's move on to the other BT parts. So as we saw, as we went through some of the ways data gets ingested and served. So there are some things related to the state man management. So the coordinator is assigning segments to historical and data nodes are serving the segments. So they are making announcements so that broker knows which data node is serving which segment. We also looked about uh, at the task management side of thing. We are overlord assigned tasks to the middle manager and middle managers are providing the task runtime status back to the overlord 
all that uses zookeeper and then there are two other cases where zookeeper gets used is in the note or service discovery and the leader is election node service discovery is basically about you bring it, bring up a druid cluster uh, pretty much every node in the system needs to know about the full cluster like what are all different nodes in the cluster and what their roles are like there are let's say 10 historicals these are their host names these are the ports they are serving data on or there might be five middle managers and things like so whole cluster needs to be aware of all the nodes in the system pretty much so for that also uh, we use zookeeper and then another part is uh, leader election so the master nodes which are the coordinator and overlord uh, we have high availability so you can kind of have at least two coordinators and two overlords running at the same time but they have the active passive hs only one of them is really active and doing any work so we need to somehow be able to select a leader between the multiple candidates we have. So again, Druid was used to do the leader election and designate one of the co coordinators or one of the overlords as the leader. So the first four things, let's try to look at the first four things and then we'll talk about the last two. So the first four are about purely state synchronization. So there, the pattern is for all four of those pretty much that uh, there'll be a writer who wants to propagate certain information in real time to other set of nodes who need to be notified immediately about the change that happened so that they can keep their local caches updated or know about it. But it has to be real time uh, push based mechanism pretty much. And that's that's how pretty much all of the state synchronization works for all the four items described here. So one standard way to do this without Zookeeper would be to actually over HTTP is to use something called HTTP long polling. And the so we want to be able to simulate the notion of a server being able to push information to the clients to the watchers, right? So the concept of uh, long polling is basically a client will send request to the server to get some information. And the server will never close uh, that connection or respond fully to that request uh, till it has some updates to give. So server will not respond to the request. So as it has more information, it will just keep on writing more responses uh, on the request or it will just hold the request if there is any update to provide it will give the response at that time so so this now if the client as soon as it gets the response back if it immediately sends the next request then it becomes real time and let's try to look at that in a little bit more detail for one of the flows where let's say historical is announcing some segments, how the broker might get uh, keep a local cache of what data is being announced by a specific historical nodes. So this is just a recap of how it works with Zookeeper. So data nodes are just writing to Zookeeper and broker is getting notified. So we want to get this notification mechanism working without Zookeeper. And in that word, things look like this broker node actually sends the long polling request to all the individual data nodes to keep track of what they are serving. So the way it works is the first request brokers will send to a specific data node would be like, give me the list of segments and then it will pass into these two parameters. There's counter and a timeout. So counter minus one says, basically, I'm starting from scratch. Give me everything that you have, like all the segments you're, you're serving. So the data node, on the other hand, uh, for this request will respond immediately, telling the broker what all does it have right now, because the counter is set to minus one. But in addition to the list of segments, it will also respond with a counter and a hash pair. 
So as soon as broker received this first response list of all segments and this counter hash pair, uh, immediately broker will send the second request. So broker always have a request open to the data node. There is never a time when broker does not have a request open. So as soon as it gets a response back from the node, it immediately sends the next request. In the next request, it will always use the counter and hash that it saw in the previous response. So counter is the mechanism that is telling historical on the other side that I already have gotten notifications up to certain, up to certain points. Give me notifications that happened beyond this counter. So if there are more updates that has happened on the historical, it will again reply and this loop will keep on repeating. If historical, let's say, had no updates beyond certain counter, then historical will hold the request till has it has any update. Or if the timeout elapses, then the historical will just uh, close the request after that timeout. No matter which is the case, in both the cases, broker will immediately start a new request. So the key is that broker always have a request open with the historical to receive the data. And so this pattern kind of keeps running. At any point, if there is a problem, then historical will just fail the request. Let's say there is a 500 or something which is which not which does not fall into the known cases. In that case, broker will destroy the local cache and start again from the first request like give me list of segment counter equal to minus one and it can again rebuild the whole cache if any problem happened. So that's how things look on the side of the client, which is the broker to get data, keep the notifications and keep the local caches up to date in real time. On the historical side, in order to uh, fulfill this request, it needs to keep a change history of all the segment updates in an array. So I think currently by default, it maintains an array of uh, thousand updates. So it is keeping a history in the array and also a snapshot of all changes that happened, right? So when the first request comes with counter minus one, it is just returning the snapshot that has it has and the current counter that it is tracking. And after that, the subsequent request, it basically looks at the counter. So it knows from its uh, change history that a user asked to resume from certain uh, counter. So it will just pick up those updates from the array and be able to respond to them. If, there, if the counter hasn't increased, that is no update has been made, then it will just hold, hold the request if by any chance, let's say client is too slow, so it sent, let's say the first request, and then let's say something happened, it was down for a while, and it sends request for a certain counter. And, and if historical, the change history has already moved beyond n changes because it has a fixed number of changes that it can keep. So in that case, it will fail the request and the broker will start from the scratch, like counter minus one, rebuild the cache. So that's how things work on the server side. So all it needs to do is maintain the change history and snapshot and keep incrementing this counter as and when any update happens. Uh, I did not describe the role of this hash. So hash exists. So every time a data node starts, it will also also create uh, store the current time so this is to prevent basically if a broker is connected to a historical and that historical restarted in between then it may happen that you ask for the route right counter but because historical was restarted so the state is totally different so hash is the kind of mechanism to ensure if historical restarted then the request will fail because the hash will not match uh, so, okay, another thing is, so we are sending these long polling requests, which, which are always there. So in general, in the JT, when you send a request, 
uh, there, there are a fixed number of jetty HTTP threads and the HTTP thread is busy serving that request. So uh, the problem is if you are holding the request all the time on the server side, then uh, there are a whole bunch of HTTP threads which are just consumed by these long pull requests. And that's unnecessary wastage of resources. So again, the standard way there is you can have something called asynchronous request response. So Jetty offers a way for doing that. Basically, uh, in this case, you can call something like request.start async. And from that point onwards, the Jetty thread that needs to serve the request is freed. And you use more like callbacks whenever something to give you right to the response. So that way, your long polling requests aren't actually holding any of the Jetty HTTP threads hostage. And that just makes things a lot more efficient. So this uh, single mechanism based on HTTP long polling can be used to serve all these different use cases of state synchronization. And this works. So we have been able to replace all four of those use cases. So you can turn on this HTTP based uh, synchronization. And in that case, the zookeeper will not be used at all for the state synchronization. And it works by the long polling. The two remaining themes are node service discovery and leader election. Yeah, I mean, even though it is possible to implement them in Druid itself, for example, node service discovery, one of the ways is you can have implement a gossip protocol where all the nodes are chatting each with each other, and you can use a specific uh, uh, algorithm for the fault tolerance and detection, et cetera. And similarly, for the leader election, you can implement your own consensus, maybe a raft. But basically, it's it's usually a good idea to delegate these problems because it takes a lot of time to mature the implementation of any of those services. And there are like very good alternatives, generic systems available, which can power the node discovery and the leader election sort of things. For example, Zookeeper is one of them. So the idea was to make the node discovery and the leader election an extensible component inside of Druid. So Druid introduced basically these three interfaces, and they you can implement your plugins using any system of your choice. So for example, you can build a plugin using Zookeeper or ETCD or anything else that provides kind of the coordination capabilities. So the next logical step is, of course, so we have been deploying Druid inside Kubernetes, and Kubernetes actually is able to power these interfaces. So we naturally wrote the extension, which implements these interfaces using the Kubernetes APIs. So let me check on time. So okay, I try to move quickly because I'm over time. But let's pass this slide. But basic thing is, in the Kubernetes, everything is running inside something called pods. A pod is a Kubernetes term. And Kubernetes itself is tracking each pod using uh, something called a pod definition. So that's the metadata for the pod that Kubernetes itself is maintaining. Those pod definitions contain things like labels and annotations, more metadata. And anybody with the right access to the pod can dynamically update these labels and annotations. Even the processes running inside the pod can go and update self pod definitions, label, and annotations. And then Kubernetes gives like watch notification type of API where you can say, hey, give me notifications for all the parts which have these labels. So when we deploy Druid in Kubernetes, of course, like all the nodes are running as parts inside Kubernetes. So whenever a Druid process comes up inside the pod, it will go and update the self pod definition and it will add these three labels to the pod definition, we have to say this discovery announcement hyphen, let's say it is the broker, then broker equal to true, a hash and the cluster identifier, because you want to be able to have multiple different root clusters running inside the same Kubernetes. So there is a cluster identifier and the annotation containing all information for the nodes. So for example, if a bro broker pod is started, that will start the broker root process. And as the broker root process starts up, 
it will add these labels in the that broker part spot definition, right? And it will also add this annotation where which contains all the information for that Druid broker, like what is the host port, what is the node type, and a whole bunch of other inf information. We need to use annotation for this information because label values have a lot of restrictions on their lengths and what characters can go inside them. But anyway, so now that all the Druid application processes are updating self part definitions with those labels, anybody who wants to watch a specific set of part nodes on the other side can just say like, hey, send a Kubernetes API request to say like, hey, notify me uh, whenever you have any parts coming up or going down with these labels. So by calling, doing this API and receiving notifications, anybody can maintain a local cache of what are all the brokers that exist in the system. So that's how the node discovery works. Uh, next is the leader election. So for, for the leader election, there is a standard uh, least-based leader election algorithm which relies on something called a test and set or compare and swap kind of operation on a remote system. Our idea is that let's say you have three candidates, they will all try to go and do a test and set on the same lock. Uh, the coordination system ensures that only one can succeed test and set as an atomic operation. Whoever succeed uh, assumes uh, that candidate as the leader and others uh, take a passive role. And then in the metadata, you can also store things like what is the use, these duration and a retry period. So every candidate who couldn't become the leader is uh, every few seconds polling and checking the lock that is the lead of current leader expired or if there is no leader, then everybody will try to again, uh, try to become leader by trying to do this test and set, or sometimes could be called trying to acquire this distributed lock. And that whole process keeps on running basically. So in Druid land, so for to be able to do data election with Kubernetes, then in the end, we need at least support for this test and set operation from the Kubernetes. So conveniently Kubernetes, all the Kubernetes resources, uh, for example, the part definition have a notion of a resource version every time any update is made to them. And Kubernetes APIs offer this concept where you can say update resource and you can specify a previous resource version. So Kubernetes will consider this like a test and set operation and this will only succeed if the resource version on the server in the Kubernetes matched for this resource. So that's basically used by the leader election implementation based on the Kubernetes. Uh, so the idea is the candidates will try to go and try to add this annotation with their individual identities and the leash duration and when they acquire the lead, et cetera, using the test and set operation and only one can win and that will be the leader uh, you can look at the details of this least-based data election algorithms that actually existed in the uh, Kubernetes Go client itself also. We didn't have to actually implement the least-based data election ourselves. And there is a Java port of it, and you can take a look at that here. Just trying to save some time. So basically, we use this Kubernetes Java client and use the reader elector uh, algorithm implemented in there. And basically with that, we can power the leader election into it also. One of the questions that came up sometimes, why did you build the extension for the Kubernetes API, not using the ETCD, which backs the Kubernetes and the simple answer there is like, in our case and most of the other cases, people use the cloud vendor managed Kubernetes and you don't actually have access to the ETCD, which is running mostly in the background powering the Kubernetes cluster. Uh, so, here you can see the details about like if somebody wanted to use uh, this Kubernetes based discovery and lead election inside their Druid cluster. This is the documentation about how to set that up in your Druid cluster. So that takes care of all the different use cases that we had 
with Zookeeper and technically you can go actually and be able to have a Druid cluster running without running a Zookeeper at all. Cool. So I know I'm over time, but if there are any quick questions, I can take them now. Uh, 